Hi, everybody. We are live. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are joining us from around the world. Welcome to this Prezi video webinar. And today we're going to be talking about how Aristotle, of all people, might handle doing a virtual presentation in this video world that we all find ourselves in. But more from Aristotle in a minute. So my name's Spencer Waldron. I work at Prezi. I'm the uh, Global Brand Communication Director. And today I'm going to be both the host and the presenter. So bear with me. I'm wearing both hats today. And I'm here in Amsterdam in the Netherlands in Europe. And my co-host, Aristotle, is uh, not only back from the past, but also all the way uh, from Athens. So I think the weather's better in Athens. So I'm going to pop inside his video meeting at the same time. So hi, Mark, I see you're from Seoul. Uh, and that's a good segue, Mark, uh, to start talking about a little bit of housekeeping. So the chat button that Mark just used, that's the best place to talk with each other and to ask questions about uh, Prezi or your account or anything else related. Um, so yes, go ahead and say where you're from. And we see we have people really from everywhere, from Houston, Texas, the UK, Netherlands, Canada, Greece. Fantastic. Well, people from Greece, uh, England. Wow, well, uh, it's too many people. I can't keep up with it. Um, so, yeah, perfect. So this is where we can have this kind of discussion. The other button that you see uh, down below is the Q&A button. And that's the button if we can please use that just for questions related to the presentation today uh, and that will help us just feel that at the end of the session as well hi everybody wow there's really a lot of people on the call it's really great to see hello from kenya scotland uk warwickshire ontario canada hi mark anna wow it's moving too fast i can't see it um Okay, so the other thing I wanted to say is, yes, we are definitely going to record today's session. We have a lot of people ask us about that. So don't worry, we, we are recording it and we're going to send it to you on email afterwards. So no worries there. We're also going to send you some other goodies along with that recording and I'll talk a little bit about those later on. So let's stay with the chat box for a second and I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, and that question is, what do you find most challenging about doing a virtual presentation in this box? What's most challenging for you? And this is going to help me kind of think, OK, what else can I talk about maybe in today's session, but also maybe content for future webinars? So I see here lots of uh, engagement, Zoom fatigue. Uh, yeah, eye contact. We're going to talk a lot about uh, the importance of eye contact and having your camera on. Um, it's all physics and no chemistry. Yeah, again, this is uh, good uh, issues because we can talk about those today. Uh, keeping the audience engaged. I think that's something we definitely hear time and time again at the moment is how can I keep people engaged and hold their attention? Um, so lots of attention and engagement. Uh, Marta says lack of eye contact, uh, connecting with the audience whilst I'm presenting. Thanks, Rita. Uh, the tech is sometimes unreliable. Wow, yes, Diane. Yeah, we all know that feeling. Um, okay, so lots of great uh, feedback there. So staying on that track, I'm going to ask a follow-up question, which is, have you, and you can answer just yes or no to this one, and that's, have you used Prezi video yet? Um, so some of you may be long time Prezi users, some of you may be first time. And for those that don't know, Prezi video is this that I'm doing now. So Prezi video is one of our three tools that we have that allows you to bring your content, your slides, your visuals onto the screen like this in a way that's live like I'm doing today, or if you want to do it pre-recorded. So have you used Prezi video? Let me say yes or no. So a real mixture between yes and no, that's good. So for the people that are saying no, at the end, I've got a little bit of information that's gonna show you how you can very quickly uh, get started and maybe try something like this. Um, okay, perfect. So 
let's get back to this webinar. So the idea of this webinar is it's going to allow you to put that light bulb on above somebody's or your audience's mind when you give a virtual presentation. Because like we've said in the in the chat area there, you know, engagement and attention is super important if we want to have impact when we give an online presentation. And I'm hoping that this content will not only help you have more content, but it will also help the people that you work with, your colleagues, your team members have impact when they're doing some kind of virtual presentation. So for me, the fundamental question we have to ask is, why do we give a presentation? Uh, and again, if you want, feel free to uh, put an answer in the chat below. Um, because there's no wrong answer here. Everybody has uh, different reasons why they you know, want to express their idea, as Rifat just said, uh, or to relay information, thanks Pam, to entertain, uh, to organize ideas, all really great answers. Um, so yeah, so lots of things like that that we think about when we're going to give a virtual presentation. But when you start looking at it, when we peel back all of the layers of these uh, reasons why we want to give a presentation, for me, it comes back to persuasion. We want to persuade somebody to think differently about what it is that we're talking about. We want them to act differently, for sure. We want them to take an action. And we also want them to feel differently about something that we're talking about. So that for me is what I wanted to understand. How can I get somebody to think, act and feel differently about what it is that I'm gonna be doing in my presentation? And that is why we created the virtual presentation framework. And I'm just gonna go ahead and remove my camera feed here for a second. Now, feel free to take a screenshot of this if you want, but don't worry, we're gonna send a high res JPEG of this to you in the follow-up email, as well as the recording of today's webinar. And the idea with this is, this is a toolbox of skills that you can employ when you want to give a virtual presentation. So let me move that out the way a little bit. And now, obviously, I can't cover all of these things today. It would take way, way too long. And it's not something that you can use all of these all the time in every presentation. But what is really important is to employ each of the, like each one of these rings in each presentation. We have to show up with credibility, we have to build trust, and we have to make that emotional connection. This is at the core of this framework, and it's also at the core of what we can learn from Aristotle. Now, the lucky things that we are is that human beings haven't changed how we made decisions in tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And we make decisions both from a conscious point of view and a subconscious point of view. So our conscious brain, and that's the like the cerebral cortex, the red bit that you see there, it's the brain that you're using right now to think, who is this person? Should I believe him? Maybe I'll check Facebook. Maybe I should go make a cup of coffee. It's our rational, logical brain. But the other part of our decision making happens in our ancient, ancient brain structures, the bits you see there in yellow and green, areas like the cerebellum, the amygdala, and that's where our unconscious lizard brain that I call it, which is responsible for so many things that we feel and do. And what's important to note is that emotions and feelings are two different things. There's only six emotions. So let's take one of them, which is fear. So what happens when we're scared? Like our heart beats faster, sweaty palms, dry mouth, adrenaline in the blood system. Now, everybody will have slightly different symptoms and I can be scared in different situations and I might get different symptoms. But an emotion is a physical thing that the body does unconsciously, way before our cerebral cortex, our conscious brain, tries to interpret what's happening to the body. And that is really important for us to understand for three different reasons. One, it's going to help us understand how we can influence people's decisions. It's also going to help us understand how we can be more persuasive. But what I think, and this is what helped me the most, is that it's going to help us be more confident when it comes to public speaking or speaking on video, because it's this lizard brain that tells us to be cautious, to be careful, and not to do these crazy things like public speaking. But there is ways that we can get around it. And I'm going to cover some of those things later on. 
Okay, so we're on the hunt for more clues about how we can be more persuasive. And what I've often found in life is if you want to find the way to move forward, we have to look in the past for the clues. So let's go back to our friend Aristotle, 2,300 years ago. Now, back then, he was forming what was an immense body of work that would be the underpinning of scientific thinking for the next 2,000 years with his work on metaphysics and the natural world and the like. Now, basically, Aristotle was studying at a school called the Academy, which was basically run by Plato. So Plato, this is him on the left and Aristotle on the right. Aristotle basically studied at the Academy for 20 years. And he was quite a radical thinker was Aristotle because Plato was of the opinion that we come up with a theory and then we fit the natural world into our theory. Whereas our rebel, uh, Aristotle, he was like, I think we need to go out into the world, observe the natural world and then come up with a theory. Now, we need to remember that 2000 years ago, science was not an established thing. And what Aristotle understood is, if I have to persuade all the people here in the academy of my radical way of thinking, I'm gonna to need to understand how to persuade people. And not only that, I need to persuade the public to adopt a new way of thinking. Now, how did he do this? There is, there's not a lot of research on this, but I found something a while back, which has really interested me, is that Aristotle used to go to a place in Greece called the Agora. And anybody who's from Greece on the call, I, please forgive me if I say this wrong. Agora was like this town square. And this is where people would basically go, speakers would go, and they would talk about this new idea that they have, and people would debate it. And by all accounts, this was a hard place to go give a presentation of sorts, because, you know, people didn't readily agree with whatever idea that you had. And that's exactly what Aristotle did. He went there and he started talking about his radical ideas time and time again. Now, what we've also learned is that this is something that Plato really didn't like. He preferred to stay in the academy and talk with people who all did this all day and understood it. But what Aristotle knew was I have to find a way to get people to accept this radical way of thinking. And that's how he developed his thoughts around persuasion and rhetoric. Because what he found was that facts alone were not going to cut it. They were not going to persuade people. He had to kind of talk to their sense of identity, of their self-interest, what's in it for them. He used things like praise and humor. He understood that he needed to take care of, maybe their pride would be hurt, or maybe they might be embarrassed if they didn't know something. So he really focused on the emotional as well as the, as, as the logical. And this really started to help him form his thoughts around persuasion. Now, we obviously know today that you know, a lot more about the brain than we've ever done, especially in the last few years. And our brains are kind of like, almost like have these three filters. They look through our eyes, our, our lizard brain looks through our eyes at the world that we see, and this is what it's looking for. Risk avoidance is the most powerful. How do I keep my human being safe? And then it's reward. You know, what's the opportunity for this human being to get food or procreate? That's where it came from millennia ago. And the third one is novelty. Well, this is new and I need to understand it because maybe that will keep me safe in the future. So these three things that we now know to be so dominant in everything we do, including our fear of public speaking, actually was already discovered by Aristotle 2000 years ago and went into his treatises on rhetoric. And if you want to kind of get into any of these things, then these are the two books I would read. Start with The Art of Rhetoric. It's a much easier read. Poetics is pretty tough going, but there's a lot of interesting things there about narrative building and how people react to it. So let's go back to Aristotle and his work on persuasion. So he came up with three modes of persuasion, and you've probably seen or heard these used. They've been around, let's face it, a very long time, 2000 years. And the three modes of persuasion, obviously ethos to begin with. And from Aristotle's work, we can see that he said, this is about, do you act and look the part? You know, what experience have you got to talk about this topic? Do you look confident? Do you sound confident? Does it look like you care about your audience? For Aristotle, ethos 
was all about credibility, reputation, and authority. And we can apply that to today, which we've done in the framework. So the second thing is Logos. And Logos is, you know, sorry, before I go to that, ethos is like our credibility ring on the framework. Logos is all about trust. Does this idea make sense? Not to us as the presenter, but to our audience, because most times there's a gap between us as the presenter and what our audience understands. Can we prove to our audience that it's true? Do we have persuasive arguments to back it up? So this is the trust ring of the framework. And the final one, and probably the most important one, is the emotional. You know, and this, I love the way that Aristotle spoke about this. You know, is your audience in the right frame of mind to actually take that message on? Because they might not be. Chances are they're definitely not when you start talking to them. So what do you need to do in order to create the right emotional state to get them to take that idea in? How do you stir people's emotion? So those three modes of persuasion are, and, the, and the theory that underpins it is, is what we basically used to create this uh, virtual presentation framework to make sure that in every presentation, we turn up with credibility, we build trust, and we make an emotional connection. Okay, so because I can magically bring Aristotle back to the future, I would like to think when I think about, okay, how might he handle doing a virtual presentation today? Well, we know that he used to like to go to the Agora and to do public addresses and speeches. So I'd like to think that if he came back today, he'd be doing tons of webinars. He'd be finding as many places to do ask me anything or fireside chats, all the things that we tend to do today, because that's the way he could learn how people react to the content. Now, I'd also like to think that maybe he wouldn't be screen sharing his slides, because what he would know is that I have to keep that connection with somebody face to face. They need to see the emotion on my face. They need to see how much I'm convinced by this argument. So I think he would be bringing content onto the screen with him. And I use this because 2000 years ago, he was using only his words and his presence. And I think what is one of the things that has started to change with us today versus 2000 years ago is our attention spans have changed. So he would use visuals and movement because movement is the gateway to attention, especially today, movement as us as the presenter, but also the movement of the visuals on the screen to make sure that he could do that engagement and attention building. And for all the people at the beginning of the call that spoke about engagement and attention, this being on camera is really important as well as movement. These are the two things that are gonna help you spike engagement. Okay. So let's dig into each three of these and, and learn a little bit about them. So remember, this is like a, a digital toolbox that we can use, uh, and we need to understand which tools might we need on each occasion. So let's start with credibility. And I just picked a handful uh, from the credibility ring of the framework. Now, these ones here that you see, microphone, camera, clothing, lighting, uh, background, Wi-Fi. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, and I see in the chat that there's been a lot of questions about the tech, and I think, and we are definitely going to send you some information in the email afterwards with links to various videos, and I can definitely send you uh, the link I saw. Somebody asked about my microphone, which is a Blue Yeti mic, um, but for me, these things have now become table stakes of credibility. So if you want to show up with credibility when we present, we have to make sure we've sorted out lighting. We have to have sorted out sound. We have to have sorted out good picture quality, stable internet, uh, make sure the background is not completely bland, but not completely busy that it distracts people. And I think, yes, some of these are gonna require some kind of budget, but you can find LED lights that are $10. You know, you can find budget options as well as, you know, the sky's the limit on this stuff. So this for me is important because this is now table stakes if you want to have credibility. If you want people to take your ideas on board, it makes it much easier. Now, the other two things I wanna talk about is slide design and confidence. And I think confidence is, is the big one. Um, so let's talk a little bit about slide design. Now, again, wow, I could talk for days on how we can design our visuals or our slides or our frames, whatever we want to call them. 
but I'm going to pick out two things. And the first thing has been around for 30 years and we still do it today. Uh, and it's symptomatic of the fact that every piece of presentation software out there will pretty much give that to you as a suggestion. And that is bullet points. Now, we've kind of been getting away with it the last few years. But if I take my camera away and you don't have the stimulus of me moving, this starts to feel pretty dull and that's where you're gonna lose your audience. So what we need to do, and this takes a very little amount of time, we wanna get rid of that and we want to replace it with a simple design element. All I've done is inserted a square and extended the square for this one, change the colors, put the text in, it takes five minutes, but this instantly starts to help you be a little bit more credible because there's nothing worse than seeing a lot of bullet points to give that dread to people that there's going to be a lot of content or a lot of boring content, even if the content's really amazing and useful for them. Okay, so next thing that can make a big difference is images. And here we have a lovely selection of what I would call pretty cheesy stock library images. And that's not to bash stock libraries. But if I, this, these images I got from a search where I just typed meeting into the search bar. Now, if I just quickly take those, because I think, yeah, that pretty much sums up a meeting, even though I know it's a bit cliched, but I have that kind of image with bullet points, that's not going to scream credibility. That's not going to help me with credibility. And what you can do, let's get rid of those, is when you go to whatever image bank that you use to get images, is type in meeting or whatever the subject is and type the word authentic afterwards because many photographers now have used the word authentic because they've taken images because they know that the trend is towards images you know here is an example of images for meetings that are much more like meetings that i've sat in it's not all people that are stunningly attractive and dressed smartly and white teeth and everybody's paying attention it's starting to go more to the world of being real and you can even have some fun with it you know who hasn't been in a meeting in the last 12 months where somebody's pet has made a cameo appearance into the call? Um, so I'm just going to stop it. Ernesto, I see you ask, how are you transitioning the slides? I have a Logitech Clicker. So that's what I'm using, but you can use the keyboard and other things just to grab that as it comes up. So we can have some fun with images. Uh, and this really helps us to kind of boost the credibility. Okay. Let's tackle the big one, confidence. And this hints at everything that we were talking about earlier in terms of how our brains work. Um, because, you know, let's face it, public speaking is scary. To stand up and offer your thoughts and opinions makes you feel vulnerable. And as we saw from before on that little brain uh, kind of visualization is we have this lizard brain. And I like to think of it as I have this demon voice inside my head and he's constantly whispering in my ear saying, Spencer, don't do it. These people are more experienced than you. Who are you to say this? And he's making my heart beat faster as I'm about to do it. And this is something that the, the, the moment for me is I suddenly realized everybody's the same because it's biology. And what we understand is even the presenters who are really confident and really experienced they still get these things happen to them before they do a presentation. They still suffer from imposter syndrome. All they've managed to do is start to understand how to manage it. And we can get rid of that little voice. And I wanna give you two things that have helped me. So the first thing is to find a motto. And my motto kind of came quite by accident more than 20 years ago. This is a photo of me when I was backpacking across Asia in the 90s. And before I went and did that as a young man, I was super scared to leave home and just go. I had no plan, very little money, a bag on my back. And I dreamt the most amazing tragedies that were going to befall me from getting sick and dying and getting lost. And, you know, and I made it seem really big. And of course, when I got there, I suddenly understood like, okay, it wasn't that bad. Actually, it was really good fun. And yeah, sure, there were hard times, but it was actually all good. And what I suddenly started to see was this pattern occur that was, it was always harder to think about something than actually doing it. And this became my unofficial motto for a long time before I just adopted it, largely because of public speaking. When I started talking on stages years ago, I suddenly understood like, 
yeah, actually, Spencer, like your imagination of how bad this is going to go actually really wasn't the case. And this motto can be really powerful. And there's lots of examples of famous people that do that. Like take Usain Bolt, for example, long before he was the fastest man on the planet and, and everybody knows his name. He was getting up at four o'clock in the morning, sacrificing lots of things to try and get there. And his lizard brain would have been telling him, ah, put the snooze button on. You're not going to do this anyway. Just focus on getting a job. But his motto was, it's for a better tomorrow. That's what got him through those hard moments. So find a motto that can help you in those moments when that demon voice is kind of whispering nasty things in our ears. It can really, really help. Okay, so the second thing that we need to talk about is spiders. Why spiders? Well, what happens if we have a fear of spiders? Well, we have to spend time around spiders. I have to be brave and put them in my hand. I have to look at pictures of spiders and watch videos about spiders. And gradually I get used to them and they get worse, uh, they get less uh, scary. It was the same with wasps. I had a crippling fear of wasps when I was a teenager. I remember being in school uh, in an exam at the end of the year and a wasp had come in through the window because it was the summer. And I almost like upended the desk to run to the exit because I couldn't be in the room with the wasp. And how did I get used to them? It was a friend of mine that helped me understand. I need to spend time around them. I need to let it just observe them and watch them and be around them and get closer and closer and closer. And this is all the same with every single fear we have, even heights. What do we do if we're scared of heights? We have to spend time at heights. And I guess you can guess where this is going. The same with video and public speaking. The more you do it, the less scary it becomes. When I first started doing video uh, live video and recorded video a few years ago, I just start, opened a YouTube channel. I didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't promote the videos. I literally recorded videos and just the, the act of hitting that publish button and putting them out there was really powerful for me. And when we launched Prezi Video in 2019, I foolishly committed on LinkedIn to say, hey, I'm going to do 30 videos in 30 days, giving 30 tips. And then I had to do it. And it was incredibly tough, but I learned so many lessons by going through that process. And my confidence spiked because I started doing it on such a regular interval. So there really is no substitute for just doing more of it. Um, so a bit boring as an answer, but actually very powerful. Okay, so that's credibility. What about trust? So trust these days, especially when we're doing virtual presentation, is all about how can I show proof or evidence by bringing up charts, data, statistics, research, things like that. But where we need to start is nobody ever bought anything or made any decision solely based on a number. So we need to not just put up a number and then think, okay, they're going to be convinced. Because what normally happens is our audience looks like that. They're going, huh, what does that mean? And that's our job. If we want to build trust, the first thing we need to do is make sure that we don't make the audience work hard. Our job is to reveal the meaning of what we've put up on the screen because they also have that risk avoidance filter. And they're thinking, so what's the story I'm gonna tell my boss? Is this all gonna go wrong and I'm gonna look a fool in front of my colleagues or my boss? Is this gonna damage my career? The brain is looking for that kind of risk stuff. So it's really, really important. Now, hang on a minute. I'll stop talking for a second because I've put a chart up on the screen. And that's what happens. If we just put up a chart on the screen, you stop listening to me as the presenter and you're thinking, what does this tell me? I can see that it's five different countries and there's a scale there, but it doesn't really tell me anything. So what we have to do is to signpost what people need to look at. So I can say, okay, here's this lovely chart. I'm going to take away everything that's not relevant to what I want to say. I'm going to turn it to gray and I'm going to use a bold color to highlight what I want you to look at. Because when I put that on the screen, straight of the way, your eyes go to Germany and you're like, okay, what do we need to know about Germany? And that's when I can then point and interact with the chart and I can zoom in and I can say, hey, we're gonna increase the investment in the German market, more people, more whatever, and it's gonna help grow that market. I can 
signpost with arrows. But what I'm doing through all of this is I'm making sure that the audience doesn't have to work hard to understand the meaning. Okay, next, in terms of building trust, we need to talk about a volcano of all things. So some of you may remember almost probably more than 10 years ago now, there was a volcano in Iceland that erupted and caused untold chaos across Europe. And what we started to see was uh, news articles in the newspapers saying that, oh my God, this volcano is really bad for the environment because it was pumping out 150,000 tons of CO2. Now, there was this amazing team of data scientists at the Guardian newspaper in the UK. And what they started to think was, hmm, so that's one data point. Let's look at some other data points. And they started looking and they said, oh, of course, because of that gigantic ash cloud that was going all the way across Europe, then all of the planes have been grounded. So how much CO2 would have those planes been putting out into the atmosphere if they had been a flying, if the volcano hadn't erupted? And I'm almost sure you can see where this is heading, but you guessed it. It was 345,000 tons of CO2. So actually the real story was not that the volcano was bad for the environment, but actually it was the world's first carbon neutral volcano. It actually reduced the amount of CO2 into the atmosphere. So I use this as a way to illustrate this idea of building trust through data robustness and multiple data points, because any one of us, can find a data point that proves what we want to say. But if somebody can come with an alternative data point and it changes the story, we're not going to have trust in the long run. So what we have to do, if we want to bridge this gap from us as the presenter to our audience, because that's what we're trying to do, we're trying to bridge this gap of trust, then we have to show robust data. That's the first stage. The right data from trustworthy sources, multiple data points. So as much as we can do, the second bit we already spoken about, that we need to reveal what does that mean? It's no good just throwing the data up on the screen and expecting people to understand it because it also distracts people. And the final piece of this puzzle is to help people identify actionable insights from that data. How can your audience use this to help them next week or help them in whatever you're doing? Hopefully that's in context of what you're there to talk about, to explain, to sell, uh, whatever. So that's it. Two things or three things almost in terms of how we can build trust. So let's close it by looking at emotion, which is kind of the last ring of the virtual framework and my favorite area. Now, I didn't on purpose actually. Here is the icon for storytelling, which I could easily talk about for two days. And the same here, this is the, the icon for values, because talking about shared values is wow, it's such an amazing topic when you get into it and how it can help you communicate and build connection. But for today, because we're talking about Aristotle, our friend, is I want to say or kind of dive into how can we help people get into the desired emotional state that they might then take on board our uh, idea or new way of thinking or something like that. So for me, you know, here's our audience and I want to talk to them and their risk avoidance filter is going, well, I'm looking out for something that's going to cause me embarrassment inside my company or it's going to go wrong or it's going to be expensive and all those millions of things. And what we normally start doing is we say, look at this amazing stuff that we've got for you over here. Your life is going to be amazing after you do whatever it is. But actually, they're not ready to take in that information yet because the risk filter is still switched on. So what we need to do is take people through this process of acknowledging the risk, acknowledging the fears that are in people's minds, get them to visualize it and then to shrink it down to something smaller. And then we can start the process of explaining the things that we want to explain. Now, we can do this in the beginning, and this is, you know, to all the people that asked about attention, how do we get people to pay attention? Well, one of the things that you can do is what I, is like mild anxiety almost, but it's about creating tension. So you say, okay, here's you right now, and here's where you could be over here. And that gap, that dissonance creates tension unconsciously. It's back to this emotional, physical thing that will happen. 
Now, what normally happens is people's rational brain kicks in. They're like, yeah, yeah, but, you know, can you do what you say you're going to do? Can you prove it to me? And that's why emotion and trust is so important. But this is the gateway to getting somebody to pay attention in the first place. Now, what we don't want to do is argue with people. The last thing we want to do when we're presenting anything is argue. But what we want them to do is say no, kind of counterintuitively. You want to know what is that risk in their mind that they're thinking about. And we can do that in a number of different ways. We can ask questions like, okay, so what about this might not work for you? Because I want to get to what is it? And when they say no, when they say because of this, then what, again, what we don't want to do is argue with people. We want to say things like, you know what, if I was in your shoes, I'd feel exactly the same way. Because what that says is I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm actually agreeing with you. But now we can talk about making it smaller because now they're feeling it, they're visualizing it. And the next thing we need to do is shrink it. Now, here, I need to go back to my fear of wasps that I spoke earlier. So I'm gonna bring my wasp back because this is how I conquered my fear of wasps. This is a well-proven psychological thing that if you say to yourself, okay, what am I scared of? I'm scared of wasps. So I need to acknowledge the fact that I'm scared of them and I need to visualize what does that look like in my head? Why am I scared of wasps? And if you remember back to my photograph of the backpacking days, my lizard brain is really good at making that fear seem really big. The wasps are bigger, noisier, angrier, and trying to come and get me. But what we can do in our mind is say, okay, I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna make you really small and I'm gonna make you black and white. And the black and white is important because it, it reduces emotion. So what you suddenly then is you start to take what it is that makes you scared and you can reduce it down to something a lot smaller. And that's what we're trying to do in our presentation because then we can start to bring in hope because in the battle for attention and getting somebody to move forward, we need to create tension in the first place, but then we need to give hope because when somebody's in hope mode, they ask questions, they explore, they wanna discover, and importantly, they want to move forward. So then we can start to use story to describe this future state, this place that you can get them to, show the steps that can get them there. So it's not an exact science, but this is a process that can really, really be powerful when we're trying to create that emotional uh, connection with people. So show emotion and passion. That's definitely one of the most important things that's happening. Now, this is something obviously that Aristotle was a big fan of. And I'm going to take Aristotle away for a second. I'm going to replace him with Winston Churchill. Yes. Thanks, Gordon. The dinner is on fire. Yes. You can't control everything. You try your best. <laughs> um, so let's go back to Winston Churchill. So Winston Churchill, not only was he a great uh, uh, public speaker, but he was also a really big uh, proponent of you have to show emotion if you want people to connect to you. And he has this amazing quote, which is, um, you know, if you want to move people to emotion, then you have to show emotion yourself. If you want to move somebody to tears, then you yourself must be moved to tears. And if you want to convince somebody, then you yourself must believe first. And what I love about this quote is what it says is, we need to see each other. You need to see the emotion on my face. It's the same reason why we cry in a sad movie. And this goes back to that lizard brain again. You know, why do we, what do we feel when we watch a powerful movie? Our heartbeats, you know, our breathing changes, maybe adrenaline. We even start to maybe have tears in the corner of our eyes. Why do we do that? We're responding to the emotion that we see on somebody's face in the movie. So what we can't be doing is hiding behind the slide. Because when I take that away and you don't see me, then it makes it much, much harder for me to actually make that emotional connection with you and things become a lot more static. Okay, so we're almost ready to get into Q&A. So if you have any Q&A about any of this, I'm gonna to go to the q and a, a in a second. But as I promised at the beginning, I just wanna say, if you want to do this kind of presenting and you haven't uh, been to Prezi before, you don't have an account, then go to prezi.com slash video and you'll start to see 
lots of great information there and how to get started. And if you do have a Prezi account, then just log in. This is the dashboard you see when you go in and you'll see Prezi video up there. And when you go into Prezi video, there's two ways that you can create. You can create using our normal Prezi present editor, but we also have a quick editor, which is, you see there the quick record button, the purple button. And when you press that, it just takes you into our editor. And we've already done lots of really cool templates for you. All you literally need to do is type in words and they appear on the screen and drag in images uh, and other content and they'll be on the screen and then you can take it live or do a pre-recorded video. So again, we'll send you lots of information uh, together with the recording, the JPEG of the framework and everything else uh, to help you through all of this. So with that, let's start to get into the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna put this up here because again, another way to get in contact with me is LinkedIn. I, I get into a lot of conversations with people on LinkedIn. So just find me, Spencer Waldron uh, on LinkedIn. And if you want to start using Prezi Video and you want you know, a bit of help, then for sure, come and find me. I'm happy to get into a conversation with you or anything related to uh, presentations or communication or anything like that. Okay, thank you. I hope you found that useful. Let's have a look at the questions. Okay, so hang on. Um, okay, Katrina. Katrina asks, is it possible to stimulate, simulate an interview, i.e. have two people on the screen talking using Prezi? Yes, you can. So all you do is you both have the Prezi video desktop downloaded and you have the same presentation open and you start talking and then somebody can pick it up and they have it on their screen. And as long as they're in the right place, so you know in advance what they're going to talk about, then you can definitely do that, no problem. Um, Lisa says, it looks like you're using a clicker. Which one are you using? So yes, I'm using the uh, Spotlight, Logitech Spotlight. Uh, we actually, actually, it was actually built with Prezi in mind as well as other softwares. Um, that's definitely one that I use a lot. It's really good. Uh, but I have another older uh, Logitech clicker and um, it also works with that as well. Um, and you can also use, obviously, the keyboard. You can use your arrow keys. You can use your mouse, anything to move the slides or the content on as you go through. Um, what else do we have? Uh, Philip asks, do you use presenter notes on Prezi video? Oh, hang on. The question disappeared. I found it difficult to see notes when presenting. There should be a kind of teleprompter instead of having to scroll during the presentation. Oh, fantastic question. Uh, it's a real mixture for me. Um, so sometimes I put the presenter notes in and when you first load up the Prezi uh, video desktop, you can actually shrink the size of the, of the notes. Uh, now, if you have obviously an entire script in there, that's going to start getting a bit wieldy. And what I normally do is I, once I've practiced, and this comes back to, you know, invest as much time as you can in your pr presentations. But like, you know, once I start to get a feel for like, okay, what's this content? What's the flow? then I, get, I cut it down to words, very short sentences that I act as like signposts to remind me what's coming next or what I want to say. Um, so I use a combination of the two, but I really try to stay away from a script because I find that if you try and stick to a script and you, you forget where you are, that can be quite catastrophic when you're doing a presentation. So I like the ability that I know roughly the, the flow and what I'm gonna talk about, but I give myself the freedom to slightly change it every time that I give the presentation and that, that I find that gives me a lot more confidence uh, and, and de-stresses things uh, a lot as well. Um, can you create interactive storytelling in Prezi? That's what Dory asks. A hundred percent. Sure. Uh, it's, you know, I, that's what I love about Prezi is that you have this ability to gradually reveal content along a journey. Um, so you can really be very creative with that and, and playful with that. Uh, as long as you've thought about in advance, okay, you know, what's, what's the main, you know, what am I trying to change in terms of how somebody thinks, acts and feels? And as long as I understand that, then I can start to build around it. Um, uh, what are some of the more creative ways to implement interactivity with Prezi? Uh, great question, Lewis. Um, so yeah, for me, it's all about interacting with the, with, the, with the graphics and the visuals, because this is movement. And what we know is movement spikes dopamine in the brain. It's why when people say, ah, yeah, but nobody has a long attention span. And you can say, yeah, but you can go to the cinema and watch a movie for two hours and not move a muscle. Why is that? 
because Hollywood figured out that if they change the scene really quickly and have moving camera angles, it spikes dopamine and you pay attention. It's the same thing that goes on with our mobile phones. So when we give a presentation, don't let anything be on the screen too long. Always have some kind of movement. Now, obviously you don't wanna take it too far because it will become too much, but don't have things too static for too long. That's definitely important. And I think interactivity like that is good. And I don't know if you can remember, but I did the thing with the light bulb where I just have two images on top of each other and I just click the button, which fades in the image and it looks like I can switch the light bulb on. So if I connect it with a click of my fingers, then it suddenly makes it look very interactive. So again, very simple, a very simple thing to do. Okay, how are we doing on time? We're doing good. Um, okay. Um, Alexandra asks, may I use effects during live presentation? Yes, you see me doing all this. We're live today, 100%. Um, uh, Thomas asks, do you have halos? I think you probably mean lighting. Uh, I actually have uh, two very old studio lights that I used when I did the YouTube channel years ago and I just have like a diffuser cover on top of them but if I was going to buy again I would get LED lights uh, probably if I could ones where you can change the temperature so you can change the color um, but the most important thing is you know can you have light on your face from a window that's always best and if not then use lights and I have one either side because what I don't want is one side in shadow and one side looking uh, bright um, and lighting, by the way, if you want another reason why to invest a little bit of money in lights, that also goes to how it can help your confidence. You know, we, we everybody speaks about Zoom fatigue. And I think one of the things is when we look at ourselves all the time on video, if we're in poor lighting, if we've got shadows under our eyes, you think, God, I look terrible. I look 10 years older. And you put lights literally take 10 years off you. So it's another good reason to invest in lighting because it can really help you with your confidence as well as making the experience look better. Uh, okay, what else do we have? Uh, Thomas Chang, how can you protect against propaganda? Wow, that's a deep question. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean with that, Thomas, but if it's about how can you, you know, there's all, there is almost like an ethics question when you think about okay if i understand how the brain works and how people make decisions then how should i use it or not and i think you know my guiding light is do you have the best interest of the person that you're talking to at heart because if you have their best interests in heart then you can't go wrong for me um but yeah for sure you know there are many examples across history of people that have used this look at our politicians and the media today they employ this as well that this ability you know what happens when you make somebody angry when you make somebody angry they want to go talk about it on social media that has so it's powerful stuff you just have to think about okay how do i want to use it for the best in the world um thomas hello thomas i know thomas uh hi spencer can you switch camera plus prezi to prezi only mode and back using this remote control yes i can uh, on the logitech clicker you can actually uh kind of set the buttons for a long press so if i long press then it will take hang on i'm not on the prezi window so if i take a long press then I can make it disappear. And if I press the other button, long press, it will bring it back again. So yeah, you can certainly program the remote uh, to do those things. That's pretty simple. It, Logitech explains how to do that when you're doing it. Um, Sibella asks, why is the image such poor resolution? Great question. That's something that we do everything we can to control, but we are at the mercy of um, video conferencing platforms. So for example, you know, we have thousands of people joining us today. So what most video conferences will do is that they will throttle the bandwidth to give the best experience possible to as many people as possible. Um, so for example, like with my internet, I have a uh, 50 megabyte upload speed, which makes sure that I can kind of make sure I give the best possible feed out. Uh, and I also have a really big download, but I'm still at the mercy of uh, what the video conferencing platforms are doing and how many people are on the call, et cetera, et cetera. And also what your uh, internet 
uh, setup is like as well. So there are many factors that go into this. Um, so yeah, it's not, there's not one quick fix for everything here. Uh, okay, what else do we have? I'm curious about what microphone. That's a good question. So I, I have um, uh, a Blue Yeti mic, but the other thing, let me bring it into view, here it is. Uh, but the other thing that I have is this protector which is, was not that expensive. It was about $30. And what that does is it kills all of the echo. So when I have it here just off screen, so hopefully the quality sound is good, but what that does, that shield behind it is it stops echo because echo can be quite a, quite a pain as well. I've done a lot of learning in that. I used to have it inside a cardboard box with foam. Um, but yeah, you have to find a way to kind of uh, use this, use microphone and sound and things like that. Um, so that's another great question. I mean, that stuff. Wow. I can, I can hark on about that for a long time. Um, okay. We're still okay on time. Um, what else do we have? Um, Lisa asks, are you in presenter mode? So can you see the upcoming object or slide that is coming? Yes. So when we when you have the um, uh, the Prezi video desktop open, I can see my uh, presenter notes at the top, just above my eye line, so I can see them. And I have my camera here, so I can keep eye contact. And to the right, I have the next piece of visual or next animation that's going to come into sequence. So I can always glance at that. Um, but I try to build that into my script as well, which is another tip that kind of really helps is sometimes you can use bridging sentences uh, to remind you, okay, I'm now, if I'm talking about this, the next thing I need to talk about that. And I also use the presenter notes. So I always, I call it like leaving myself a trail of breadcrumbs uh, that in the, heat, in the heat of the moment when I go, oh my God, what was I going to talk about? Then I have some breadcrumbs to help me find my way. Um, but yeah, you need to find whatever works for you. Um, John asks about the background. What's the best background? Again, we're going to send information on this, but you know, for me, I think it's finding the balance of not having a completely white, bland background, because again, depending on what you're going to wear, you might fade into the background. Um, but equally, you don't want something that's really, really messy. So I just have a sofa and a plant and, and I keep it tidy. Obviously, you know, the kids use this room as well. So I make sure all their PlayStation stuff isn't everywhere. But I try to keep it so there's some kind of background interest that breaks it up a bit, but nothing that's distracting. And I think, you know, don't distract people. That's the, the key thing with that. Um, how do you time pre-designed content with live presentation discussion? Is there a behind scenes that queuing up the content? Uh, no, Marty, thanks for the question. I'm basically doing all of the things to do with the content. So it's just literally me and my clicker and my presentation and a few hours of practice to make sure because you can learn the content and you can do the presentation. But another really great tip when you're giving a virtual presentation is if you can say something first and then bring it up on the screen, that is so much more impactful than bringing it up on the screen and then talking about it. And I still can't master it all the time. I still get lost sometimes and I click and think, ah, I didn't say that before, I've, I've been too late. But actually, if you can find, get into that habit of saying something first, then bringing it up onto the screen, that also kind of really helps you bring uh, impact up. Uh, Rita asks, are you standing? Yes, a really great question. This comes up a lot, you know, do you sit down, do you stand up? And for me, it was something in the beginning I didn't even think about because I came from doing years and years of stage talks where I'm always on my feet. And I think for me, it gives me a completely different energy when I'm standing than when I'm sitting because I'm more hunched over and I don't feel quite the same. So for me, I think standing, and it gives me more ability to kind of move around the content as well. So I can very quickly, you know, play with the visuals on the screen more. Um, so yeah, I definitely stand up. I think that's uh, really good. Uh, Rita also asks, I assume you're unscripted. Uh, kind of, I always start with a script. The way before I get to designing my Prezi, the first thing I do is I think, okay, who's my audience? What do I want them to think, feel and act uh, and do after I've given that presentation? What's the change that I'm trying to make? And then I start and I know, okay, I've, if I've got 20 minutes, on average, we speak 130 words per minute. So I need two to two and a half thousand words. 
and I write an outline and I write the script. And I, once I have the script, then I start to design, but then I throw the script away almost, you know, I use it a couple of times to get the flow, but what I never want to be is completely tied to the script because it drives me mad and I'll lose it. So I give myself the ability to, A, I need to know the content well to do this, but also it just allows me to tell the story slightly differently every time. And it takes an enormous amount of pressure off you that you don't have to remember it word for word. Um, but yeah, it's, it's boring, but it's hours and hours of practice. Uh, okay, what else have we got? We've got a few minutes left. I don't, uh, wow, so many questions. This is really great. Um, will we get instructions on how to do the tech of any uploaded PowerPoint slides to Prezi video? Yes, we are going to send you links to some videos and training and how to do things. Uh, so definitely take a look at those. And like I said, you know, find me on uh, LinkedIn. I'm also always happy to help if you need it. Um, uh, Bradley asks, what is your recommendation for something that does long classes, i.e. two consecutive full days. Wow, kudos to you. That's not easy to do two days worth of content. Um, if it's virtual, then I think you entirely have to give people breaks uh, from too much you know, kind of stimulation almost. So I think, you know, sometimes you'll notice a couple of times in my presentation, I took the camera feed away because I didn't want the distraction of me moving in the background. I wanted you to focus on content that was on the screen. So I think you need to just find that balance of, okay, how can I, you know, have times where I am very stimulating for people and times when it's less uh, and things like that. But wow, that's, we could open up that topic and do two days worth of content about it, I guess. You can probably teach us a lot as well. Um, uh, um, Thomas, hello again. Can you choose the mode in the Prezi video app with the clicker, presenter only, graphics only, both? Uh, it's basically with, with the Logitech clicker, you download the software, it appears in my status bar at the top, and I do all of the setup in the, the piece of software that comes with the clicker. So I don't do anything inside Prezi connected to the clicker. It's all within Logitech's software. Um, hang on a second. Gabe asks, if I upload transparent images, will Prezi present and then Prezi video remember that transparency? Yes, as long as you upload it that way, it will stay that way at all. Or does it need to have a special green background or something? No, definitely not. Just all the things that I have, like this laptop image is just a PNG. You know, it was literally, I just, you know, put it in and it stays like that and it remembers it. So you don't need to do anything. Um, and yeah, and then I just use the fade in and fade out. Uh, um, Grant asks, can standing actually have too much movement for some people presenting? Like it distracts more than engages. Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, even when I go back to when I used to do the lots of stage talking, you know, I'm quite expressive with my hands. Um, and when I first started this, when I was first starting out, uh, I used to be with my hands moving a lot. And somebody told me when you're doing stage talking, so this is not virtual, but when you're doing stage talking, if you keep your arms in a one meter by one meter box, it doesn't distract the audience. But if it goes outside that one meter by one meter, it starts to get distracting, which is really such an amazing tip. And what I'm trying to do in this virtual box that we're in is, you know, you notice I have my hands, but they're slightly below the camera view because I want to be able to bring that movement in, but I'm trying to not because I can move them here, but you don't see. So I'm still trying to control. Yeah, you don't want too much movement because, you know, at the end of the day, the focus needs to be on you and the content as you're presenting it. Great question, thanks. Um, okay, well, wow, the questions keep coming. Uh, we've only got time for a couple more because I don't want to keep people past the hour. Uh, let's see if we've got any that are not Prezi related because we can send a lot of information about that. Um, Hang on a second. A video on your workflow for this talk will be so helpful. Yeah, Robert, thank you for that. Um, this is the next, I've got a series of three webinars coming up where I'm going to be doing exactly that. How can you build a Prezi video from scratch? So I can also make sure we get that out to people as well. Um, 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 I'm just scrolling through some of the questions. 
Uh, uh, mm. Oh, that's a good question. I'll take that one. Oleg, uh, awesome presentation. Many thanks. How do you handle Zoom meetings when you have to keep the Zoom window side by side with the Prezi app in order to see both? Yes. So I always have uh, lots of windows all shrunk down on my on my uh, screen. I only have one screen. I'm not using uh, dual screens. I probably should. That might make my life easier, but I quite like just the one screen. It's a big screen. It's not like a laptop screen. So I have like a 32 uh, inch uh, external screen. And what I do is I have the Zoom app here to the left. So today is actually a lot easier because I've only got myself on the Zoom thing at the moment, but I normally want to keep an eye on what's going on there. I have my big, uh, my Prezi video app window open pretty big because that's I'm using to uh, A, look at the camera, B, check what's happening with the content. I need to see my presenter notes. Uh, and then I've broken out like the chat window and the Q&A window and I have those dotted around as well. And sometimes I even have digital post-it notes in other places where there's other things that I want to remember. Um, but again, that's kind of a personal, you have to find the way that works for you. Um, but yeah, so I always have the Prezi video app as my main window. Um, hang on a second. So yeah, we're about at the top of the hour. So I think I'm going to call it a day there because, well, wow, we could be here for another hour with, wow, what amazing questions. Thank you. It's, uh, it's really great to get questions because uh, it shows you care. And if you care, that's one of the best things that you can do to make sure that you start giving a really good virtual presentation. So I hope you found this useful. To remind you, yes, we are gonna send the recording out. Um, we're gonna send it with uh, a JPEG of the virtual framework, links to lots of how-tos and trainings, uh, information about how you can do all of the tech setup and stuff like that. Um, so definitely you're gonna get that. And thank you, thank you, thank you for turning up today and giving me an hour of your time. It's hugely appreciated. Um, and yeah, I would love to see what you do with Prezi Video. Find me on LinkedIn and that's it for me today. So have a great rest of your day or evening and hopefully I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.